Hey, what's up guys, Paulo Munoz here. Today, I'm gonna to show you how to create horns inside ZBrush. I'm gonna show you a few different techniques to create the setup or the blocking, as well as detailing and editing those horns. So let's jump straight into it. All right, so here we are in ZBrush. I'm using the default UI so that you can follow along. And you might recognize the creature character here that I have in the screen, and that is from a previous tutorial. And that previous tutorial is all about creating the wings or this type of membrane for kind of like bat and dragon wings. Uh, but today we're gonna focus on the horn. So I'll put a link in case you wanna follow along with the with the creation of the wings, but uh, we're gonna focus on the horns. All right, so I'm gonna show you a few different techniques. And uh, let me just bring in my Epic Pen here. Um, and I'm gonna focus on four specific things. So the first one is going to be with array. So we're gonna use the array mesh for the first technique. The second one is just the curve. The third one is going to be the formers, formers, and the fourth one is going to be primitives. All right, so there's a lot more ways to achieve the same thing. I just thought these uh, four specific features or processes in ZBrush are going to be really handy to create this type of horns and um, overall the same look and feel that you have here or that you can see here. All right, and before we start, let me just show you some of the, the brushes that I'm going to use uh, to speed things up. And they're available in the ZBrush Guide store in case you, you want them. So I'm going to use the Rocks pack. Uh, just to create, you know, a quick texture for the horns, and you'll see how easy that is. And other than that, you can do the same thing with, the, you know, a clay brush or a clay build-up brush, and you'll achieve, like, similar results. But I just use the custom brushes because it just makes it a lot easier and faster. All right, so let's start with the first technique with the array. I'm going to click on the tool um, thumbnail here, click on cylinder, let's move out a little bit, and I'm going to click on make polymesh 3D. All right, so now this is a mesh that we can edit. I'm gonna also change the material to basic material. Click on the move, scale, or rotate, and enable the Gizmo 3D. And I'm gonna scale this down like so. And the idea with this technique is to create a section of the horn, and then we're gonna use the array mesh to duplicate it. So uh, pretty straightforward, but it's a very powerful technique. All right, so this is currently just a very simple cylinder. I'm gonna go to the geometry palette. I'm gonna open up the Dynamesh palette and I'm gonna dynamesh this as it is. So now we have a few more uh, points to, to edit, right? I'm also going to polish things so that you don't see the faceted polygons. So let's click on the deformation palette and let's use the polish one. I like to use the polish one because it kind of like gives you this, a bit of a blobbiness towards the edges. If you don't like that, you can use something else like the polish by groups. Uh, well, not in this case, but something like polish by features. Uh, but yeah, the polish one should be all good. All right, so that's kind of like what I needed. Now let's go back up. Um, and I'm gonna use, like I said, the, the brush that I mentioned from the pack. So I'm gonna bring in my lightbox by clicking the uh, comma key. And I'm gonna use this one, the Quick Cliff Builder. I'm gonna double click on that. And there we go. I'm gonna increase my brush size. And just to show you, this is what this brush does. So you can see, it just makes it a lot easier to create this kind of like weird details. And it's also a good example of how a very specific brushes pack, uh, like rocks, can be used in other situations for creatures and that sort of thing. All right, another thing I wanna do just to speed things up is go to the transform palette, and I'm gonna click on activate symmetry in the X axis, that way I can work in both sides, and I'm just gonna do this all around this, uh, this cylinder. All right, perfect. Now, now let's go ahead and go to the Dynamesh section here. I'm gonna increase the resolution quite a bit, so almost Yes, 600, 600 should be okay. Hold control, click and drag, and redynamize that. So now we have a lot more points to play around with. So that initial, um, initial setup is just to deform the, the surface a little bit, but I'm going to go to polish, and I'm gonna remove that faceted polygons again. So a couple of times using the polish tool, and you'll see we have that uh, variation in the surface. But now, if I do this, we're gonna have a lot more detail. So I'm gonna go up and down, and pressing a different kind of like different pressure levels. All right, and just for fun, let's turn off the symmetry and then let's add a few more details here in the center so that it doesn't look that it is so symmetrical. Let's do the same thing here at the back, right? Uh, but yeah, I think in terms of details, I think that works. You can go ahead and also smooth things out um, and spend a lot more time uh, dealing with kind of like the details of this mesh. You can also change to a different brush. I'm gonna click on the brush palette and let's filter by the letter uh, T and let's use the trim adaptive or the trim dynamic. And then you can use these with a smaller brush to sort of like clip some of those details um, a little bit more, like so. 
this is kind of like what the, the first step is, is to have a cylinder that is relatively short and then add some details. All right, so now that we are done with the this part, we can go ahead and duplicate it. Now, right now we have 850,000 active points. So if we duplicate this a few times, we're gonna end up with a lot of polygons. So the best thing to do is, in this case, since we're gonna duplicate a few times, is decimate the model. So let me go ahead and open up this left tray, and I'm gonna go to the C plugin palette and dock that to the left. And I'm gonna go to the decimation master. I'm gonna click on pre-process current. And what this is going to do is tell Silverish to analyze this uh, selected subtool, and then we will be able to decimate it. So maintaining uh, most of the details and the yeah the overall shape, but reducing the polygon count. All right. So let me actually scroll this bar here a bit. Oh, by the way, this is a cool uh, thing that I don't know if you're aware of that you can actually move this bar. And I'm doing that by holding the control key. So I'm hovering over any empty area around here, hold control, click and drag. And that way it's kind of like hard to get it, but that way you can sort of like scroll these bits of the UI. Uh, you could do the same thing for this area right here and this area right here. Anyway, this is outside of the tutorial. All right, so we have 800,000 polygons or 850,000. So now that I have pre-processed this entire mesh, I'm gonna decimate it by, let's go for 5% and click on decimate current. So now you see we have 42,000, so that's a lot more manageable. Let's enable polyframe so you can see. That's what Sirush has done, it's just decimated everything, optimized the mesh, uh, but I think I can do a bit better than this. So let's do 1% decimate current, and we have 8,000. All right, so that's a little bit better. We lose a bit of the details, but that doesn't matter. Like from the distance, it works fine. And the cool thing about it is that once you have the horn, you can, uh, you know, dynamish it again and add more details if you wanted to. All right, so time for the first technique. Let's go ahead and open up the array mesh tab here, or the palette. And I'm gonna go ahead and click on Array Mesh. So as soon as I do that, well, nothing happens because I haven't tweaked anything, but I'm gonna tell Silverish that I want to repeat this at least uh, 12 times. All right, let's go for 12 or 15, whatever you feel like. Uh, this is the amount of rings or pieces that is gonna be duplicated. Uh, but again, nothing is happening because we haven't told Silverish how we wanna uh, move this. So if I click on, let's say the Y amount in the offset, I can do this and you see how these things are being pushed up or down, but I'm gonna do it in an easier way. Uh, so let's set this back to zero. I'm gonna actually use the transpose tool, right? So if I enable this, I can now go to the move. Uh, let's actually close up this thing so that you can see better what I'm doing. There we go. Click on move and I'm gonna switch from the gizmo. You could actually use the gizmo, but I'm gonna use the transpose line. So I'm gonna switch this gizmo off and now I have the transpose line. And what I'll do is with the move selected, I'm gonna click on the center, uh, this white circle here, and then I'm gonna push this up like so, and if I hold the shift key, I can just do it uh, proportionally, or not proportionally, but constrain it to this axis. So let's do that again, holding shift. So I'm gonna do something like, something like this, and that is already working pretty nicely. Now, one thing that you'll notice is that obviously, the repetition is pretty evident. So we're repeating the things and it's not looking as cool, right? So a very simple thing you can do is, again, go back to the transpose line, but this time I'm gonna select the rotation, and you can just click from the bottom and drag to top, holding shift again. And now I can click on the center and rotate it like so. So I can rotate things a bit. And that obviously is going to rotate the each one of these pieces. It just makes it a lot more interesting. If you wanna do um, everything from the sliders, you can. Uh, in fact, let's just go to draw. As you can see, we have the amount and we're using the offset to basically take this piece and offset it this value up. Uh, but you can also go to the rotate tab here. And that's what I just did. I rotated this amount with the transpose line. I just think it's a lot easier to use the transpose line, but you, by all means, you can just do this to do exactly the same thing, right? And that is all we need to do. Now, another cool thing that I wanna do is being able to kind of like create a, a taper effect. So right now, this is almost like a, like a perfect square. What I wanna do is have a little bit of an indentation here so that it feels that each piece fits within each other, right? Uh, and that's gonna be really easy using the array mesh. So what I wanna do is go to the transform palette, click on the activate symmetry, but this time I'm gonna select the Y axis and disable the X axis. I'm gonna enable radial symmetry and I'm gonna change the radial count to 16. So if I change my brush to, let's say the move brush, let's filter by the letter M, move brush and increase my brush size. When I get closer to this, to this piece, you see we have a bunch of instances of the brush. So look what happens if I click and drag to push this thing in, right? It's happening in all the instances of this array mesh. So this is a really cool way of, 
you know, changing the, the size of your mesh, like the overall shape. And that is pretty cool, <laughs> right? So it's pretty simple once you get the hang of it. All I've done so far is duplicated this piece with the array mesh and then use the radial symmetry to adjust this. And you can do the same thing with any sculpting brush if you wanted to. So if I press the shift key to smooth this out, I can smooth everything and it will be replicated across the entire set. But I'm going to undo that. And that's pretty much it. This is the first technique almost done, but obviously to make it a little bit more interesting and so that it looks more like a horn, what I'll do is here at the bottom, click on make mesh. And that basically um, apply these settings so that now this entire thing is a mesh. And the next thing I want to do is I'm going to turn off the symmetry and I'm going to bring in the gizmo, the gizmo 3D. I'm going to click on this location center to center it in this area. And I'm going to hold the alt key and click on the rotation. So that way I can reset the rotation. Uh, holding the alt key only means just unlocking the gizmo. So if I press alt, you see that is just unlocking the gizmo. Without holding Alt, you can do the same thing. You can just click on that to unlock it and do this, and it's not going to affect the mesh. So I'm just pressing Alt and reset the rotation. Um, this is important because now this gizmo is in the center of the entire volume. And what I can do is click on the gear icon, and this is going to give you a, a slide insight into what another technique that I'm going to show you, uh, which is using the former. So I'm going to use the taper, the former. And from the top cone here, I'm going to click and drag down just a bit. And from the bottom, I think it's fine, but you know, we can do something like this. And then with the white cone, we can control the, uh, the profile, right? So you can do a lot of different things. Let's go for something like this. Click on the gear icon and click accept. So now we have changed the, the shape of this guy. And if you want to bend it, you know, if it is not a, obviously a straight horn, what we can do is again, go to the deformers, click on bend arc. And this is going to change, uh, it's going to create an arc, for, <laughs> basically. So if I click on this arc, we can just push it this way. And now we have this, this arc in effect. And again, we can control how big this is from the white cone. So right now, this is kind of like a, like a, yeah, a large thin horn, but I can just push this down and make it a little bit more compact, as you can see. So lots of different variations with a very simple method. All right, I kind of like this one. Um, let's click on the gear icon, click on bend. And let's center this again. And you can do something else that, you know, is going to make it a lot more interesting. So I would save this one as one variant. But if you want, you can click on the gear icon. Also use the twist uh, deformer. And now we can go ahead and twist this a little bit like so. And now we have a really cool, very complex, um, you know, mesh that if you want, remember this has been decimated. But if you want, you can just dynamesh the whole thing and add more details and, you know, add some uh, crevices or, you know, whatever you want. All right, so what I'll do is I'm going to go to the uh, subtool palette and let's leave this one as it is, but I'm going to duplicate it. So I'm going to click on duplicate and now I have two of the same. And this means that in the duplicate, I have no undo histories, but in the first one, I can just go ahead and go back to the first state before I use the array mesh. So around here, let's just double check array mesh. Yep. So this is the state before I enable array mesh. And I'm going to toggle off this secondary. All right, so that's the first technique done using array mesh. I just have the duplicate here so that I can keep working. And then I came back to this decimated version to show you another one. All right, so the next technique is also really, really fun and is using the curves inside ZBrush. So let's go ahead and create a horn curve by going to the brush thumbnail. And I'm going to click on Create Insert Mesh and click on New. That is going to create a mesh based on the camera angle that we can insert. So it's very important that before you actually click on create insert mesh, you are looking at this angle of the camera from one side, because if you do it from this angle, it's not going to work. Or if you do it from this angle, it's going to create it based on that angle and it's just not going to work. So make sure that you have the perspective off. You start rotating the camera and hold shift to make it um, kind of like fit that view and then create that. But now that I created, I can click and drag and you'll see, uh, let's ignore that. You can click and drag and create these pieces very easily. All right. So now that I have this IMM brush, I'm going to go to the stroke palette. In fact, let's just dock that to the right hand side and I'm going to open up the curve here. Right. And all I have to do is click on curve mode and you'll see if I increase my brush size, I can just go ahead and do this. And now we have a nice curve with this piece. So that's, you know, it's very simple. So two, literally two steps creating the IMM brush by going to the brush palette, click on create insert mesh, and then open up the stroke palette, click on curve mode, and you have your curve. But obviously there's a few things that we can do to improve this. So I'm going to leave this one as it is, um, just to show you kind of like the progression and open up the left panel 
and this time I'm gonna remove the C plugin and I'm gonna bring in the brush palette which is what we're gonna use to uh, modify a few things so let me just clear this up a little bit and I'm gonna open up the modifiers right and on the modifiers what I want to do is click on this stretch right and this is going to stretch these pieces so that we don't have any gaps um, so let's just click once on the curve to update it. You see it's been stretched and that's kind of like what we want. And we can increase the resolution of the curve. So I'm going to set it to 10 and the bend maximal angle. Uh, I'm going to set it to, I think the 45 is fine, but let's just leave it at 50. Click again and then you see how it's a little bit smoother or like rounder. That is because of the resolution and the max bend arc. So that's pretty much it, right? But if we want to also have the tapering effect, what we can do is from the stroke palette, go to the, the modifiers of the curve and we can enable size. Right now there's nothing happening. So I'm going to click on size and I'm going to click on this curve fall off, right? And if I just click on the curve to update it, this is what we're going to get. So at the beginning or the left hand side of this profile, we have a very tiny base. And then towards the right hand side, we have a large base. So I want this, but the opposite. So let's click on flip vertical. And now it's going to start large and then decrease. So let's click again once to update. There we go. And perhaps I don't want it to be that tiny. So I'm going to push this there, click to update, and then maybe add a bit of, kind of like nice tapering effect to the, to the curve. And that is a lot better. All right. A couple more things to finalize this curve, because if I rotate around, you'll see that the curve is actually in this place, but the curve is outside the curve or it's like on the side. But I want it to be uh, following exactly where the curve is in the middle, if that makes sense. Uh, or like the, the curve will be in the middle of the volume. And that's a very easy thing to do. We're going to go to depth here on the brush palette. And you see we have this thumbnail. I'm going to click on this and push it to zero. Or you can just type here zero and hit enter. And let's go ahead and click on the curve again to update it. You'll see that now the curve is right in the center of this tube or in this horn. And that is pretty much it really. <laughs> that's the end. One thing that I want to do just to make things easier. Uh, because the, the great thing about this technique is that you can edit the curve. So you can click on the curve and move things around right? And then alter it, or maybe you can increase the brush size and click on it to update it. So that is the great thing about it. But one thing that you can do to make your life easier when you're editing is to go to the stroke palette. And here on the curve, I'm going to go ahead and click on lock start and lock end, right? And what that allows me to do is push this like so, and the start is going to be lock. Now the end is moving because I have this disabled, so I can click on that. And now you see both the end and the start will stay locked just because of this one. So you can do that if you want. I think, you know, moving the, the end uh, is fine. It's just like the, the base that I like to keep uh, static or in place. And that is about it, right? So if you don't want to have to do this again, what you can do or recreate the brush, you can go to the brush palette here at the top and perhaps you can create an icon for it. All you have to do is find a nice angle, something that you would recognize and click on select icon that will create that icon for you. And then you can go ahead and save this as a brush. All right. But now that we have this, um, let me just show you how you can create a nice um, horn or something for a character. So let's just jump back to this creature right here. And the way that I would apply it, something like this, I'm going to turn off this other horn as well, would be to just simply uh, clicking on append and click on append uh, sphere, anything, a cube, whatever, select the cube and go all the way to the bottom of the tool palette to initialize. And I'm going to click on Q cube. So that creates a tiny cube. That's very simple. I'm going to scale it even more and just, you know, hide it somewhere inside the body. It doesn't really matter. I will delete it at the end. And then on that tool or in that sub tool, I can go ahead and create a weird looking crazy horn like this, right? I'm also going to turn off polyframe so I can see it. So let's go ahead and place the base and then I can do anything I want with this horn. So that's why I thought this technique would be pretty useful. And I think it's a, a really cool one as well. Another thing you can do as well with the curve brushes, as you know, as you can edit them, you can also uh, smooth them out. So if I have something like this and I don't like this bend, I can click once on the curve, right? And then hold the shift key and I will be able to smooth out that curve, right? So that is pretty cool. Let's go ahead and push this just a bit um, and then click somewhere else just to lock that in. And if I go into solo, you'll see that that has been applied into that cube. So what I can do is clear the mask and now I can hold control and shift to access my selection tools and holding the alt key. So control shift and then alt to hide that bit and I can delete it. I have a shortcut, which is control X, but for you guys would be on the geometry, modify topology and delete hidden. 
and that is pretty much it. If you want to have now two horns, obviously, in this case, we can go to the deformation palette, and here I can mirror so that it's on the other side, and then on the modifier topology, <laughs> going back in here, I can click on mirror and well. And this is the reason I have in my custom UI, I have the mirror and well, as well as the mirror button in a custom UI, so I can access them a little bit easier because they're in different palettes. But now we have these two horns and, you know, you can dynamesh it, you can maybe inflate things if you want to close the gaps a little bit of this. Uh, so you can just go, um, let's go inflate right and then go to dynamesh and this is just something extra not not part of the technique i think you get the idea i can click on dynamesh this is too low let's increase the resolution even more so yeah you can just play with that right and that way you can just add other set of details if you wanted to uh, but yeah hopefully that helps that's the the second uh, the second technique and now the other ones are going to be a lot easier and faster to create so let's go ahead and do that i'm going to click on the cylinder just to bring this in, let's collapse this so we have more real estate to work with. This is a simple cylinder, by the way. So let's click on Make Polymesh 3D, bring in the gizmo, and I'm gonna scale this down and scale in the Y axis. Okay, so this is gonna be another type of way to really quickly create a horn. So what I wanna do is go to the Dynamesh again and Dynamesh this. So I think that's plenty of resolution, that's good. And now that we have that, we can go ahead and bring in the brush. Uh, or any brush really, you can do this with the clay builder brush. Like I said, I like to use these custom brushes because it speeds up the process quite a bit. And I'm gonna go ahead and go to transform, activate symmetry, the same thing as before, enable it just in the Y axis, radial symmetry, and this time I'm gonna use a radial count of eight. And that way I can just do this type of stuff very quickly, add some details. Again, they're a bit random, but it's okay. And let's go ahead and increase the resolution a tiny bit more, redynamesh, and I'm gonna smooth everything. And this time, just to change a little bit of this pattern, what we can do is go to the um, radial symmetry and go for like an odd number, maybe five. And we still have the radial symmetry, but now we're combining different symmetry or different values in the symmetry. So it creates a very interesting pattern. Let's do the same thing again, uh, but this time I'm gonna go for three. And I think, you know, odd numbers in this case work a lot better. So we started with eight, but you could start with seven or nine. And again, that's just to build the base of the horn really quickly. Alrighty, so now that we have these details, I wanna also remove the radial symmetry, go back to the X and turn off the Y. So now we have the normal uh, symmetry, like the on the X axis. And what I wanna use is the standard brush. So click on the brush palette, let's filter by the letter S and the standard brush right here. And I'm gonna increase the brush size quite a bit and then hold the Alt key to push things in. So I'm gonna push this in just a bit so that we can create this indentation, say. And now that we have a rough idea, uh, we can go ahead and also with the smooth brush, smooth this out a bit more, right? And I'm gonna use this, this area right here. Let me just move it a bit. I'm gonna use this area with the damp standard brush to add a bit of uh, crevice in there. So I'm gonna go for D, damp standard brush, and just do this. And I'm doing this extremely fast just because I'm interested in showing you the full scope of these techniques uh, rather than focusing on the details. That's something that obviously you can spend a lot more time doing, but this is roughly the process. So you get that nice sort of like rich edge and all of these details on this side. You can do the same thing on this side, right? You can do things like this to make it a bit more custom and more interesting. But the idea is to create a cylinder that by using the radial symmetry, you can detail really quickly before you actually convert it into you know, the shape of a horn. But once you're happy with the details and everything that you set up in this um, boring tube, we can make it more interesting by bringing in the C plugin palette. So we're gonna repeat what we did for that curve before. So decimated pre-processed current. So we're gonna analyze this entire mesh. And right now, uh, let me just check, let's collapse this. We have uh, 300,000, so it's not, it's not much. You can just go for like two millions, whatever you want. And I'm gonna decimate these by 5% this time so that we can retain, uh, maybe that is too much. Let's go for 20% so that we can retain more of the details and that should be okay. Awesome, so we now have a much more optimized version of the mesh. So we have 67,000. Now the cool thing is that we're gonna use the formers as our third technique. So I'm gonna bring in the gizmo, click on the, actually uh, let's turn off symmetry and then set it into the center and hold the Alt key and set rotation again, just to make sure that this is right in the center of the volume of that bounding box of the cylinder. And I'm gonna click on the gear icon and I'm gonna use taper. We've already used that before. So I'm just gonna use this to give it a bit of tapering and use this white cone 
to change that a little bit. Um, and in fact, maybe we can do the, the base a little bit thicker. All right, that's cool. So accept that and you'll see how quick, you know, something a little bit more interesting that that tube can be done just using the deformers. Now, the next one is the really cool one. So I'm going to show you how to apply it in a real world scenario, like in a, in a character, right? So before I use it, I'm going to actually append it or paste it into my working file with the creature. Let's click on copy and then let's go to the creature. Let's turn this one off and click on paste. And what we can do to make it fit the, the right size, because this is too big, is go to the deformation palette and click on unify. That's going to make it, uh, it's going to make it fit within the two by two by two volume that Sirish likes. And we can scale it even more. Now, the trick here is to maintain that original gizmo, the position of the gizmo and the rotation within the center of this piece, right? Uh, we can actually center it a little bit more so it's better, uh, but maintain the rotation, right? And this is very important. I'll show you why in a second. So let's just place this guy somewhere here and we can rotate things around. That's totally fine. The only thing that you need to keep in mind is that the alignment of the gizmo needs to be maintained. So in other words, if I hold the Alt key and click on rotation, that is going to change the rotation of the gizmo. And that's just going to, it's not going to work in the same way because the deformers deal with the volume and not necessarily the, the continuity of the topology. Hopefully it's going to make sense in just a second. Uh, but basically this is it. Now I'm going to click on the gear icon and click on bend curve. So if I click that, you see that the volume, even though I rotated the mesh, is sort of following the, the length of this, um, this horn. So now I'm going to click on this um, cone here to add more points. So right now we have one and two, and those points are being added in the Y axis. So if I go back to the gizmo, you see the Y or green axis is the one pointing in this direction, uh, the, kind of like the length of it. So that's why this one is green, but you can change that to be on the X axis. So you see now two points in there or in the Z axis. So let's just set it to the green one, so the Y axis, and increase the number of points. I would recommend to keep it simple, maybe five or uh, six points is more than enough, and then you can add more and tweak it. But now that we have these points, I can just go ahead and do this, and then really customize the look and feel of this horn. Um, and it's a really fun thing to do, really easy, and what's really cool about this whole thing is that, I'm gonna go into solo mode, by the way, <laughs> so it's easier. Um, what's really cool about this is that we already have those uh, nice details that we can sort of capitalize on when we wanted to. Not only that, but this curve modifier or, or the former allows you to rotate things. So if I click on this point, uh, it's hard to see, but you have this orange icon, which allows you to twist things, and you have this white one that allows you to scale it, and this one that allows you to flatten or squeeze it. So what I'll do is, we did one selected, click on this one, and you'll see I can rotate things around. And I'm going to rotate all of them a bit so we have a nice uh, twist effect. Let's click on that one as well, right? And if for some reason you want to, you know, stretch this out, you can do that as well. Uh, maybe the, the base you want it to be thicker, you can click on the white cone here and then do this sort of stuff. Click on this one, scale. So a lot of complexity can be be easily done just with um, these deformers. So just to recap this technique, once you have that cylinder or that uh, that boring tube, you can use the taper deformer to give it uh, thickness, and then you can use the bent uh, curve to basically place it in, in place. <laughs> That's it. So let's go out of solo mode. Now that is at this point, you can just move it in place and use the move brush if you wanted to adjust this a little bit more. And that's basically what I do once I have the block out uh, and remesh it or uh, dynamesh it again and add more details. Now, one thing just to explain what I was talking about, the, you know, not moving or not changing the, the rotation of this a bit further is, let's say if I have this in here. Now, this gizmo is right in the center of the entire volume. Right, so whatever I see or whatever I look at this, this is right in the center of this volume. But because it's not a straight, like let's say a tube, if I go now into the bend curve, you'll see that it is using the volume and I can still deform it, but it's not gonna be the same, right? You're gonna get these issues. So it's very important that uh, for this technique, you maintain the rotation aligned with that initial um, horn. So one workflow tip that I can give you is you can keep everything at this stage, like when you was straight, and then just duplicate it every time that you wanna try a new horn. Uh, but that's about it, right? That's the deformer, also a very, very cool technique. And to wrap up this tutorial, I'm gonna show you yet another technique using uh, primitives, which is also very, very cool. And let's go ahead and click on the tool icon, and I'm gonna click on Spiral 3D, this one right here. So I'm gonna click on that, and this is what we get, right? So if I enable polyframe, you see 
it's a pretty clean and simple um, shape. And if I try to use the move brush, I won't be able to do it. I click and I get this message saying, this needs to be converted into a polymesh 3D. Now, the reason um, I wanna show you this is because this is a really cool technique to generate a complex shape while maintaining a clean base topology. So the cool thing about the primitives is that we can control the original shape from the initialize tab. So at the bottom of the tool palette, I'm gonna expand initialize, and these settings are gonna be different depending on which um, which primitive you choose, right? So if it is a cylinder, it's going to be different and so on and so forth. And the awesome thing about this is that these are literally just math. So you can just change the, the curve and it will be changed dynamically. So for example, the, the thickness of the beginning or the, the starting point can be changed. So you see the beginning of this spiral has changed. Um, and an easy thing to remember, let me just show you this. In ZBrush, in most cases, uh, like if you look into you know, the filters, the, the VPR filters or fiber mesh or things like that, you might see that there are like a section that has left um, or sliders on the left and sliders on the right. So uh, actually let's do it with a different color. This is a kind of like an important concept overall in ZBrush. So the ones on the left hand side, they deal with the tip or the end, let's say of a curve. So in this case, that is this part or this uh, slider side for that part. And the beginning or the left hand side, obviously, deals with the root or the base um, you know, of fibers or anything, right? So you have these two sets in there. So let's say I wanna increase the thickness of the beginning and then a little bit of the end as well so that it's not that tiny. And I don't want it to be that long so I can change the coverage as well. And you'll see that it's getting this sort of like weird warping. That is because it's trying to do the spiral from kind of like zero from the center. So we can change the radius of that. So I can click on this one and push it like so. So I'm changing the radius. If I go all the way to 100, it's just gonna create this, you know, spiral, you know, and I can just basically set every every slider to the same and it's just gonna be like a, like a spiral. So let's change that a little bit. Um, you can also change the radius of the bottom or of the root as well. So very cool. And if I want to scale this up a little bit so that it just feels more like a horn, um, although this is kind of like a like a ram type of horn um, or a snail shell, but you can take this one and you can push it, you can displace it. So right now it's set to one, we can take this and we can displace it a bit more and maybe take the, the root one and displace it even more. So now you have something a bit more interesting. All right, and you can also change things like the twisting. So I'll do that just to show you how cool this is. Uh, but you can also change the, the, the S divide and the, um, the L divide. So it's gonna change the amount of subdivisions. So that's why I wanted to show you this last technique because you can have a lot of control of the, the topology and it's gonna give you a clean topology that you can subdivide and add details. So I'm gonna use a bit of twisting on the end, just a tiny bit. Maybe that is too much actually. Something subtle and I'll show you why. All right, so that's looking good. Let's go ahead now that you have created those tweaks just with sliders. I'm gonna click on Make Polymesh 3D and now this becomes something that you can edit, right? Now the, the cool thing about this technique is this, just changing the primitives to get the base shape. But on top of that, we can do a couple more things to improve the look of this with polygroups. So let's go ahead first and scroll down to the deformation palette. And I'm gonna use the smooth modifier. So this one right here, or the smooth uh, slider, sorry. Just to smooth things a little bit so that it's not as sharp, right? So you can see the difference straight away. And if you want something a little bit thicker, you can use the inflate to just inflate it, but I'll leave that one to the end. And now let's go ahead and create some polygroups. So now let's go ahead and hold Control and Shift to access our selection tools. I wanna change from the rectangular to the select lasso. So the select lasso is pretty cool because it allows us to uh, select uh, the edge loops. So I'll show you what that, that means in a second. So I'm gonna hold Control and Shift and click on one of those lines in here or those edges. And if I click on that, you'll see it just selects the entire edge loop all the way. Um, also, let's go to the bottom here of the tool palette, display properties, enable double so that we can see inside. And I'm gonna do the same thing from this point. So now we have this area and then this one right here. And here at the end, let's do the same thing in here. So holding control and shift and clicking on this. So I basically isolated that entire loop and we can go to the polygroups uh, palette here or sub palette, click on auto groups. And because these are now they're not continuity. This, I, I literally just hit a uh, polyloop all around. Zbrush now assigns two different polygroups. All right, so now I can bring this back. 
and actually let's hold control and shift click on the selection tools go back to select rectangular piece and I'm going to hide hold control and shift and click on this and this point so that I can hide the other one and hold control and W to assign a polygroup or you can click on group visible and then bring back everything so basically now we have only two uh, polygroups and the idea is that you can use the select lasso to isolate the loop first and then auto group and then just you know create only two out of those three so um, a bit of a process there but it's not too bad and what we can do now is go to the geometry palette and I'm gonna divide this a few times um, so 80,000 polygons and it's a lot smoother and we can also hold the control and shift key to isolate this hold control once in the canvas and click to mask this entire thing or this entire uh, visible polygroup and then hold control and shift click and once in the canvas and that way bring back everything let's go ahead and turn off the polyframe now and you'll see we have essentially masked that and we can go ahead and hold control and click once on that mask to blur that mask we can even hold control and click once in the canvas to invert it and then hold control again and click on the mask so that basically blurs things out a little bit but I'm not gonna do that um, maybe just a bit so basically now I have mask I inverted the mask and I have the green polygroup mask and this other one is not masked and I can just go to the deformation palette open that one up and I can use the inflate to deflate so I'm gonna use the the negative values of the inflate to just push this in like so just to create something slightly different right that's pretty cool and if you wanted to you can also polish just this area so I can just flatten things a bit more just by polishing uh, you can also use um, the relax um, you can also use smooth so you can play around with all of these deformers and if you want you can also use the normal brushes and because we have subdivision levels we can go back to a lower subdivision level and maybe use the smooth brush just to to smooth this out even further you can also use the um, the polish deformer but you know just want to show you a bit more a few more techniques all right so now we can clear the mask go back to the highest subdivision level and just keep refining this but you see this is a very complex shape that can be done very very easy using the primitives and a little bit of tweaking with polygroups and the formers all right so that's it for this tutorial hopefully these techniques have been of help and remember it's not just about creating horns uh, although that's what I showed you today but these are very powerful features and and workflows that you can use in a bunch of other different things now if you're interested in the brushes that I use at the beginning to detail um, the horn and any other set of brushes you can go to the zbrushguides.store and they're all in there all right I'll see you in the next video cheers